After almost 12 years, we have returned to new Phyrexia, and alongside the plane, Poison, one of Magic's most infamous mechanics, has reared its ugly head once again. Or, more precisely, the discourse surrounding it has. It's long been a point of discussion as to whether or not the poison threshold in EDH should be raised to match its elevated starting life total, and with the introduction of Toxic in All Will Be One and its accompanying precon, the debate is more relevant than ever. However, while I am personally of the opinion that nothing needs to change, it has got me thinking about why people hate poison so passionately. And the conclusion I reached is that while there are multiple reasons for why people dislike the mechanic, at their core, they all share a common underlying issue. Whether or not it is, poison feels unfair. Regardless of the fact that the poison player essentially has to 1v3 the table, at first glance, it feels counterintuitive that while your life total doubles when transferring from 60 to 100 cards, your alternate life total does not. When someone sends their souped up Glistener Elf at you and you get one shot, that feels like you're getting picked on, even though in reality, it's not really any different from Voltron or various other aggro strategies. As you'll note, in both of these examples, I've laid out the caveats explaining why I think these aren't good justifications. However, there's still one more that even I struggled to disprove, and it's the fact that it's near impossible to interact with poison counters on defense. And this gave me a twisted idea. Well, with the exception of leeches, you can't reverse poison, you can proactively prevent it from popping off by means of doomblading their dude. It's pretty hard for Blighted Agent to bop you if it's dead, <laughs> after all. So, what if I built an Infect deck that could win entirely on the stack? Barring blue, how does anyone interact with that? Before we begin, a quick reminder that if you do enjoy today's video, clicking like and subscribe are cost-free ways to keep high-effort content like this coming. And so, let's take a look at the most toxic brew I've ever built. Nimrus Una's Trickster is a 5-mana 1-6 legendary Demir Fairy Knight with Flash and Flying that reads, Whenever you cast your first spell during each opponent's turn, look at the top two cards of your library. Put one of those cards into your hand and the other into your graveyard. Not to mince words, Nimra sits at the helm of this deck for the sole purpose of providing a card advantage engine in the command zone. While we'll cover these cards in a moment, even with one, there are still only a handful of spells that provide each player with a poison counter, and with them being our sole way to win, we desperately require a means of consistently digging for them, and Nimrus fits that bill beautifully. Not only does he obviously pad your hand size himself, but he also encourages the inclusion of inexpensive cantrips, because optimally, you'll be activating his ability on each of your enemy's end steps, and this supplies an inconceivable speed with which you can tear through your 99. Furthermore, including our fairy, this deck only deploys a sum of six creatures, so it should go without saying that our inclination as an archetype is towards that of control. And would you look at that, you know what else is instant speed? Counter and kill spells, both of which benefit immensely from breaking the parity of their traditional one-for-one -one rate, courtesy of Una's Trickster. As I said though, our aim is to nagging thoughts as often as possible. However, it's hard to justify burning premium interaction when your opponents are simply establishing or otherwise accomplishing very little. Hence, not all of our interaction is premium. Spells that rebate their cost essentially cycle, sculpting your hand to an unnecessary extent while simultaneously leaving you with plenty of land to weave in additional pieces of pricey pickup. That all said, there is one last quality of Nimrus that demanded a nod during deck building, and it's the fact that instead of flat out drawing a card, he takes out any trash in your top two. Because of this, abilities that allow you to sling spells from your cemetery, such as Flashback and Jumpstart, make the choice 
easy, and Delve rewards your discarding of resources in the form of immensely overpowered effects, a la dig through time. But okay, we've eaten our vegetables, cleaned our room, folded our laundry, finally, it's time to feature the fun stuff. Whenever a new set comes out, one of my biggest inspirations for the corresponding commander deck I construct is its limited environment. Obviously, when Wizards designs a set, they correlate color combinations with specific strategies, and I find that taking those ideas and using a broader card pool to enhance their power level is exciting. All of this is to say, the initial spark for this episode's pile was none other than Prologue to Phyresis. After drafting the Demir Proliferate deck and further investigating the other instants and sorceries that similarly supplied poison counters, I was convinced that this plan had legs. I mean, come on, a cantrip, an edict, a divination, a wrath? What more could you ask for? That said, I also knew that five cards, oh, right, sorry, Icker Rats is here too, was hardly enough to construct an efficient kill condition. But as I said before, the archetype we were aiming to impersonate was Demir Proliferate. And so when I thought about it, what I realized is that you only really ever need to find one of your poison cards to actually assemble a victory, and this made things much more manageable. In the same vein as our Infectious Includes, there already existed several super solid playables that proliferated and cycled themselves at the same time, and that was independent of not only the new one they printed, but also the Phyrexian Commander Sphere that for some reason dark rituals every turn too. At this point, our foundation was already super solid, but furthermore, any seasoned EDH player is familiar with Flux Channeler and Inexorable Tide, two cards that I was fairly confident could come in handy as a crutch to combo close a game in one cataclysmic turn should our attempts at winning passively fail to put us over the top. Not to mention, since I knew I'd jumped the shark the second I started slapping this disaster piece together, I also hypothesized, well, wait, if our plan is already to hold mana up, given our desire to play at instant speed, couldn't Karn's Bastion alternatively act as a ticking time bomb, take advantage of the taboo against terminating lands to largely protect it? And oh boy, I'm glad I did, because this card does some serious heavy lifting, and in testing, heisted me multiple matches I had no right winning. But stepping back for a second, I've always emphasized that if you're going to employ an engine in your deck, you should do your best to keep it from becoming one-dimensional. What I mean by this is that while poison may win us the game, there are other things we can proliferate to put ourselves in the driver's seat. For instance, manipulating the hour counters on Midnight Clock can earn you an early wheel, adding oil to Mind Splice Apparatus will save you a mountain of mana, especially when multi-spelling, and speaking of which, charging up Everflowing Chalice is synonymous, but not as restrictive as to what you can accelerate out as a result. Yet, while it may be the case that the proliferate posse augments our armory of infect, it would still be irresponsible to assume that a tenth of our library is a perfect percentage to be dependent on, and so while this is an unconventional use of the concept, if we can't go wide, we must go tall. Instead of relying on a critical mass of counter compilers, we can copy and recur them, thereby maximizing the worth of each one individually. For example, Mission Briefing is a banger because of the fact that it's also instant speed, Swarm Intelligence is insane as if it sticks for a turn cycle, I've often found it impossible to outvalue, and the Mirari Conjecture is kind of a combination of both, except it itself also has unique applications in this list because of the fact that you can accelerate its accumulation of lore counters. Finally, I feel it's my responsibility to remind you all that while this is most definitely a goofy infect deck, the reality is 
it's an infect deck nonetheless. And because of that fact alone, tables are going to try and target you down, perhaps unjustly. Which is why I've prepared for that too. While certainly not the norm, there is more than one ghostly prison in blue, and to preserve our life total, propaganda and its four mana counterpart, collective restraint, act as impenetrable deterrents early and acceptable ones late, at which point you'll hopefully have access to other means of dancing around damage. If you're still in the market for more content, I'm also on Twitter and Twitch, at KidInTheOffice. And until next time, a big thank you to everyone at home watching, much love, and peace.